It's Monday, the 27th of March. My name's Juan Brown, and you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And today we have a very detailed preliminary investigation from the NTSB regarding the loss of Dana Hyde, a former Clinton and Obama administration official, back on the 3rd of March on the Bombardier BD-100 Challenger 300 jet departing Keene, New Hampshire. Let's check it out. This fatality was initially reported as a result of turbulence, but that turns out to not be the case. The weather was fine on the day of the accident. Winds on the ground, only six knots. Visibility, 10 miles, broken at 16,000 feet, day VFR. I wanna start at the end of the report here where it says a representative with Executive Flight Services LLC reported that they managed the airplane and employed the flight crew. EFS reported that the flight was operated as a non-revenue FAR Part 91 flight operated by the owner of the airplane, Connexon LLC. Connexon provides rural internet service. So remember, there are three different fundamental FAR parts. FAR Part 91, general aviation, that gives us the most latitude and freedom from rules and regulations. FAR Part 135, charter flying and FAR Part 121, which governs airline operations. This flight was operated under Part 91. Now about the pilots. According to the FAA, the PIC held an ATP, Air Transport Pilot Rating, and a PIC, or Pilot in Command Rating, for the accident airplane, which is required for this aircraft, in addition to other type ratings. The PIC had a total of 5,061 hours of flying time and just 88 hours in the accident make and model aircraft. The second in command, ATP rated 8,000 hours flying time and just 78 hours in the aircraft. They both completed their training for this aircraft in October of 2022. Now this preliminary report reads as a series of unfortunate events primarily instigated by the crew. Now, starting on the second paragraph, the flight crew reported that after a routine pre-flight inspection, engine start and taxi for departure, a takeoff was initiated. The second in command reported that during the takeoff roll on runway two, the airplane accelerated normally. However, he observed that the right primary flight display airspeed indicator miscompared compared to the left side airspeed indicator and an aborted takeoff was performed. They reached about 104 knots maximum speed on this aborted takeoff. The PIC slowed the airplane down without issue and exited the runway onto the taxiway. The left engine was shut down and the co-pilot opened the main cabin door, walked out in front of the airplane where he subsequently observed that the red pedo probe cover remained installed on the right side pedo probe. Big mistake, major distraction. How did we forget the pedo probe on the pre-flight inspection, but it happens. It's it's happened to, <laughs> in my general aviation flying, it's much more common than, I've, I've never seen this happen in an airline operation, but it can happen to you, especially under a general a part 91 flight. The SIC removed the cover and did not see any damage to the probe and returned to the cockpit. The PIC restarted the left engine and resumed the taxi to runway two. So I'm not a, a Challenger pilot and I'm not well versed on Challenger systems, but these are large, complicated electronic airplanes. If you don't shut the whole thing down and restart it after you've got such a divergence of data, you may be introducing a lot of problems into the system. The reason they caught this on uh, the takeoff roll is it is a common practice in high performance aircraft working together as a crew, CRM, that you both look, as you're doing your takeoff roll, you look at your airspeed indicators and you call out 80 knots and confirm to each other that both air speeds are indicating the same value. So they caught, they trapped this error at 80 knots or whatever the call out is for the challenger. I'm looking for you challenger guys to help me out with the details on this. Shortly after the left engine was started, the crew reported that an ICAS in engine indicating and crew alerting system advisory message of rudder limiter fault enunciated. The PIC reported that he attempted two ground avionics stall tests to clear the message 
as he'd received this advisory message in the past during ground operations. However, the test did not clear the enunciation. The flight was continued given that the message was an advisory and not a caution or a warning. Again, if this had been a part 121 airline operation, we would have stopped the flight right there and had maintenance check this out and clear the rudder limiter fault before continuing on on the flight. The airplane is trying to tell you something right here. Now let's take a look at what this rudder limiter fault means. Though this had nothing to do with the actual incident, it's a sign that the airplane is trying to tell you something, that something's up. The basic idea with a rudder limiter is on high performance aircraft like the Challenger 300 and any airline type aircraft, the amount of rudder travel that you have available to you varies with your airspeed. The lower your airspeed is, as shown in this chart here on the vertical axis is degrees of rudder and on the horizontal axis is speed, the slower your airspeed is, the greater amount of rudder travel you need in the event of an engine failure on a twin engine aircraft. The higher, the faster you're going, the less rudder travel you need because you can easily overstress the aircraft if you have full rudder travel at high speeds. So it is the job of the rudder limiter to produce this curve and reduce the amount of rudder travel as speed increases. Now, the flight crew further reported that during the second takeoff, the acceleration was normal. However, the second in command noticed that the V speeds were not set. All right, the, the, <laughs> did the crew miss this initially or were the v speed, did the V speeds drop out after the first aborted takeoff between the first aborted takeoff and the second takeoff, the crew should have noticed that the V speeds dropped out before they took off on the second departure. Did they go through the entire checklist procedure again before the second departure? They would have been able to capture the loss of their V speeds. That's the, the, the speeds on... The V speeds are the speeds on the airspeed indicator that are giving you your, your V1 speed, your rotate, your V2 speed. The second command called V1 and rotated at 116 knots from memory. He remembered it from the last takeoff. And the PIC entered the climb without issue. As the initial climb and turn on course progressed, the PIC reported that the autopilot was engaged. And they continued to climb to 6,000 feet MSL and were subsequently cleared to flight level 240, 24,000 feet. Now again, the autopilot's on. The flight crew reported that around 6,000 feet, they observed multiple ICAST caution messages. Again, the airplane's trying to tell you something. The crew recalled ICAST messages, autopilot stab trim fail, parentheses autopilot stabilizer trim failure, mock trim fail, and autopilot holding nose down. Neither crew member could exactly recall the, the order that they were presented. They also reported that additional ICAST messages may have also been enunciated. The captain asked the co-pilot to refer to the quick reference handbook. When you get into a runaway trim situation, as what these indications are indicating to me, you need to have that procedure memorized. And there's been a movement lately, even in the airline industry, to get away from memorized procedures and refer to quick reference cards and or checklists. But when you're messing around with the elevator trim, you need to get that turned off right away from memory. But before you do that, you gotta turn off the autopilot and auto throttles. The captain asked the co-pilot to refer to the quick reference handbook. The co-pilot via an electronic flight pad, an iPad, so you're fumbling around with that, located the quick reference card. Now the card should be a card. It should, <laughs> those critical items that we used to have memorized have now been reduced to a single card about that big that you just should have at your reach right there and be able to reference it right quickly. But really you should have these things in your head memorized. Now challenge your pilots, challenge me on this. The co-pilot showed the captain the checklist and they both agreed to execute the checklist. The first action on the checklist was to move the stabilizer trim switches, stab trim, located on the center console from primary to off. 
the SIC read the checklist item aloud and subsequently moved the switch to off. That's right. From memory, you just know to turn those stab trim switches off. But what happens if you leave the autopilot connected while you do this? As soon as the switch position was moved, the airplane abruptly pitched up. Remember the ICAST message about autopilot holding nose down? The aircraft is trimming to a nose up position. The PIC reported that his left hand was on the flight controls and his right hand was guarding the right side of the flight controls. He immediately, with both hands, regained control of the airplane in what he estimated to be a few seconds after the airplane's pitch oscillated up and down. During the oscillations, and we'll look at these values, and they're pretty extreme, the PIC instructed the SIC to move the stabilizer trim switch back to the primary position, which the SIC accomplished. Now, this is beginning to sound a lot like the 737 MAX problems, where he's trying to regain control of the trim. <sighs> Instead of using the manual trim, the pilot reported that preceding the that preceding the rapid pitch event, the autopilot was on, and he expected that once the stabilizer trim switch was turned off, the autopilot would disconnect, which it did. But he obviously didn't expect it to disconnect so abruptly. The PIC reported that he had no problem manually flying the airplane after the in-flight upset, nor did he experience any abnormalities trimming the airplane using the manual pitch to rim switch located on the control column at any point during the flight. Shortly after the in-flight upset, the flight crew were alerted by a passenger that another passenger had been injured. The co-pilot exited the cockpit to check on the passenger to provide medical attention for a short period of time. He subsequently informed the captain that there was a medical emergency and they needed to return to land. So for you Challenger pilots, is there a way to trim the Challenger manually with the stab trim cutout switches and cutout? Or did this pilot turn the stab trim system back on and then subsequently trim the aircraft? So the crew performed a diversion to Bradley Windsor Locks Airport and they did not re-engage the autopilot for the remainder of the flight and got the pass passenger off to the hospital. The flight crew reported that they did not experience any remarkable turbulence during the flight nor during the time immediately surrounding the in-flight upset event. So that turbulence report must have got out from the media incorrectly. Now, according to preliminary data recovered from the uh, flight data recorder, this is why it's so important to have these recorders on board this aircraft. It really tells the story. The airplane during the first takeoff attempt reached a maximum airspeed of about 104 knots displayed on the left PFD indicator and only two knots on the right PFD indicator before the abort was initiated. So they captured that error, they captured that failure by doing the 80 knot call out. No significant difference in airspeed was observed in the data for the remainder of the flight. Following the second in command's removal of the pitot cover, <laughs> it helps. Throughout the initial climb, multiple pilot commanded manual pitch trim inputs and corresponding movements from the horizontal stabilizer were observed. Now, is that with the autopilot on? During the climb, the preliminary FDR data showed that the autopilot had been engaged and disengaged three separate instances. With each autopilot in an engagement, an immediate master caution was enunciated. Note the FDR does not record the specific ICAST caution messages. The autopilot disconnected in the first two instances after manual pitch trim was activated. Well, yeah, anytime you activate manual pitch trim in most of the Boeing aircraft that I fly, if you manually pitch trim the aircraft, it will kick off the autopilot. And small pitch oscillations were observed after the disengagement. The autopilot was re-engaged for the final time at 6,230 feet MSL and remained on until reaching... 22,780 feet MSL, and the air, airplane's airspeed had, in, had increased from 238 to 274 knots in this segment of the climb. Immediately preceding the in-flight upset event, the autopilot abnormal disconnect parameter was activated, and no manual pitch trim inputs were recorded. 
This data was consistent with the flight crew's report that the stabilizer trim switch was moved from primary to off, which resulted in the autopilot disengaging. Now here's the data on the violent pitch up. The airplane immediately pitched up to about 11 degrees. This is when they turned the stab trim switches off with the autopilot on. The airplane immediately pitched up to 11 degrees and reached a vertical acceleration of 3.8 Gs. That's nearly four times your body weight. The airplane subsequently entered a negative vertical acceleration of about a negative 2.3 Gs. That is a huge pushover. That's getting right to the limits of the G limits of the aircraft, the structural limits of the aircraft. The airplane pitched up again to about 20 degrees of vertical acceleration at 4.2 Gs. So if you're a 150 pound person, you're weighing over 600 pounds right now. And if you're not in belted in or in an incorrect position, and you're certainly not ready for it, none of the passengers would be ready for this. If you're in a bad position, that could easily kill you. The stall protection stick pusher activated during this pitch up. Subsequently, vertical acceleration lowered to about 2.2 Gs, which was followed by a cutout of the FDR data. The FDR and cockpit voice recorder were equipped with an impact switch, an impact switch G switch. Interesting. So I wonder if that thing, if it thought it hit the ground and it stopped recording data. The CVR continued to record for an additional 10 minutes as it was equipped with a backup power supply. However, the CVR also stopped recording data prior to landing at BDL. So it'll be very interesting to see how the crew work together to handle this situation and how that compares to the standard operating procedures with the Challenger jet. A sudden G onset can literally knock you out. And if you're in a bad position and you bang your head, bam, that could kill you. Problems with elevator trim can be very problematic. As we learned here from the galloping ghost accident at Reno so many years ago, at race speed, nearly 500 miles an hour, when this elevator trim failed, this aircraft pulled up so abruptly that it knocked the pilot right out immediately, burying him in the cockpit, completely losing control of the aircraft. And of course, it was the first iteration of the MCAS system on the 737 MAX that caused the runaway pitch trim situation that led to these two disasters. As a result of this accident investigation and its relatively high profile nature, an airworthiness directive has come out on Bombardier aircraft regarding the no back pawl installation of the horizontal pitch trim system in the aircraft. This proposed AD was prompted by a report that a design deficiency was discovered which could allow a no back pawl to be incorrectly installed in the horizontal stabilizer trim actuator. The no back mechanism is a primary means to prevent back driving of the horizontal stabilizer trim assembly and motor brake assemblies. They are the secondary means. If this condition is not corrected, a non-functioning no back mechanism in combination with a, a failed motor brake assembly could lead to complete loss of control of the aircraft. When you shut the stab trim cutout switches off, you need that trim to stop moving and lock it in position. So, if there is no lock on that runaway trim, you can aerodynamically, through aerodynamic forces, override the no back mechanism and the brake assembly and cause that trim to continue to run away. And if it, that trim continues to run away, full deflection one way or the other, depending on the speed of the aircraft, you could easily lose control of the entire aircraft like we learned in the 737 MAX disasters. So in this case, it would take a double failure to produce a loss of control of the aircraft. You would have to lose both the no back mechanism and the braking capability in order to lose the lose control of the stabilizer or horizontal stabilizer trim. In my opinion, I, I bet you when they get to looking at this airplane, they'll find that there is nothing wrong with this airplane because it was reported by the crew that they were able to easily hand fly the aircraft once the autopilot was turned off. So we have a couple of relatively new pilots to the airframe. 
having a series of distractions or blunders that lead to leaving a pedo cover on and failing to capture the mistake of resetting the v-speeds after an aborted takeoff and then continuing to operate with a rudder limiter fault light indication instead of shutting the whole aircraft down or returning it to maintenance or resetting the entire aircraft to try to remove the fault and then referring then having a runaway trim situation or a problem with the autopilot and referring to a checklist instead of referring to a memory item and turning off the stabilizer trim cutout switches before disconnecting the autopilot and auto throttle and hand flying the aircraft resulting in a massive pitch up which resulted in a fatality so it'll be very interesting to see what the rest of the report comes out with once they get the uh, cockpit voice recorder data see how this crew worked this out together as a as a team and see what the exact standard operating procedures are for the challenger 300 thanks so much for your support of this channel especially the folks over on patreon that make this content possible see you here <laughs>